Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. We're pleased to welcome Ken White, a former federal prosecutor turned criminal defense attorney by day, who runs the provocative Pope Hat blog by night. Ken, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Ken, we've got to get this out of the way right up front so people don't get the wrong idea. Why is your blog, which you bill as a group complaint about law, liberty, and leisure, called Pope Hat? Well, it's kind of an inside joke. Some friends uh, were fond of playing poker, and one of them used to make an origami Pope hat out of uh, whatever dollar bills were present. And it seemed that whenever he wore the origami Pope hat, he could not be defeated. He was <laughs> infallible. And since bloggers seem to consider themselves infallible and their posts like papal edicts, it seemed an appropriate name. <laughs> it fits. I, I enjoy reading your blog so much. Give us a feeling of what sort of topics you focus on. Well, over the years, we've come to focus a lot on free speech issues, both legal and cultural, and on sort of explaining some of the intricacies of the legal system in a way that makes sense to people, and hopefully in a way that's entertaining. Uh, we talk a lot about the culture of free speech and anti-free speech on the internet or on college campuses, and a fair amount about the criminal justice system, given my current job as a defense attorney and my background as a prosecutor. Well, you started out blogging anonymously before you came out of the closet, although I understand some of your fellow Pope Hat bloggers do try to keep a low profile. Have you experienced any professional blowback over speaking your mind so colorfully on the internet? Not a lot, but a little. I had a case where I was representing another blogger pro bono in a free speech case, a rather frivolous lawsuit filed mm -hmm. against him in federal court. And the plaintiff's lawyer pulled a quote from one of my posts and put it in a brief basically for the exact opposite proposition that I had set it for. Hmm. And uh, the judge seemed to buy it. It was sort of a snide remark about the client uh, being a prosecutor and sort of a friendly jab at him from the defense side. And uh, that just sort of goes to show that you can be sarcastic and mean to be sarcastic, but that doesn't mean that everyone will always pick up the sarcasm. But for the most part, no, I haven't gotten any serious blowback. But then I'm lucky. I mean, I, I am a partner and I have my name on the door, mm. so I, I don't suffer the uh, same vulnerabilities that a lot of people out there do. You don't have to worry about firing yourself. Exactly. <laughs> do your kids give you grief? The kids uh, are pretty oblivious. To it. <laughs> uh, I think now and then my, my son refers to me writing or blogging derisively, but they seem to regard it the same way as they do Facebook, meaning, you know, for old people. All right, let's get to some more serious issues. You recently wrote that this may come as a surprise, but I'm a supporter of safe spaces. Actually, it surprised me. You go on to say you support safe spaces because you believe in freedom of association. To what extent do we still have freedom of association in the U.S., and how would your concept of safe spaces apply on college campuses? Well, it would apply only with great difficulty on college campuses these days. You know, I see it legitimate that people want to get together with like-minded people and feel safe in a group. And if they want to do that, more power to them. If, and you know, and you can put it negatively. If people want to shut themselves off from the world and avoid uh, ideas they don't like, then it, let them congregate with other like-minded people. But on college campuses, that's increasingly difficult. There's been in the last few years a move to force groups to admit people who don't hold the group's views. So, for instance, the Supreme Court upheld rules at public schools that basically said that a Christian student group could be forced to accept people who didn't adhere to the particular faith mm -hmm. values of the group under anti-discrimination principles. So, sure, purely private clubs, everyone still has the ability to do pretty freely, but to the extent that you want to do public-supported clubs or official college groups or things like that, it's somewhat difficult to uh, really make a safe space that's only like-minded people. You know, some people might disagree with me on whether or not that's a good thing. You also said that safe space can be used as a shield or as a sword. What did you mean by that? Well, what I mean is this. If I decide that you know, I don't like people who are talking about some particular topic, I can decide not to hang out with them. I can hang out with my friends instead. If I find some particular position on the Middle East or on gay marriage or on the economy 
to be obnoxious. I can just avoid people who talk about it. That's safe space as a shield. It's my voluntary association with other people. What I mean by safe space as a sword is when people, for instance, students on college campuses, aggressively assert that they have a right to make the whole campus a safe space, by which they mean a space safe from views they don't like. So when people say certain speakers shouldn't be invited to the school by anybody because it, it makes them feel unsafe, that's safe space as sort, because it's not just saying I shouldn't be forced to go uh, listen to this person, which no one is unless you go to Liberty University. It's saying that this person shouldn't be allowed to speak on campus just to, because just the existence of this opposing view on campus makes me feel unsafe. When you talk about the right not to be offended, you wrote that the market rather than the courts could secure such a right through branding and advertising. Get into that a little bit. Well, sure. No one has any sort of constitutional or, I would argue, moral right not to be offended. Uh, that right can't be reconciled with the right to free speech, right? Mm -hmm. If I have a right to speak my mind and you have a right for me not to speak my mind, if it offends you, then those two things are in, in fundamental conflict. But, I mean, the market can handle it. What I mean by that is this. If my views are obnoxious and offensive, then people are generally going to avoid me. Uh, my views will be unpopular. People will not agree. People will not follow them. I will not find myself a popular fellow. And that's, that's the marketplace of ideas taking care of offensive and obnoxious ideas rather than some sort of official sanction taking care of them. Well, you went on to talk about something you called Snowflake University. Well, that was kind of a mostly tongue-in-cheek idea mm -hmm. I had that if students are so sincere and wanting a safe space, then you could really have colleges kind of engage in a market. So you can make decisions about, am I going to go to the college that agrees that everyone has a right to be safe on campus and there should be no offensive ideas? Should, do I want to go to a college organized that way? Or do I want to go to a college organized around the idea that college is a place for a wide variety of ideas, some of which we're going to find offensive, and that short of things that are illegal, we're going to expect you to not like it, but to tolerate it. And my hope would be that many people would go to the real, what I'll call the real university that enjoy a broad variety of ideas. But I'm getting uh, increasingly pessimistic about whether people would go to the real universities or to Snowflake U, where they are told that will keep you away from ideas that upset you. Well, some colleges are busy constructing online systems where students can anonymously report microaggressions, presumably so that an offended registry could be built to support things like disciplinary reviews against students or, or tenure reviews against faculty. Why is that any different than Yelp reviews for restaurants? Well, how it's different depends on what the university does with the information. If a university creates a sort of college Yelp for people to gripe about fellow students and professors. I, I might think it's unseemly, but as long as the information is not used in the official sanction, I don't think it's really a violation of free speech. It might you know, encourage a somewhat Orwellian atmosphere, but if they're not saying, well, you know, this student complained you said this, so you're not getting tenure, mm. or this student complained you offended them, so you're suspended for a semester, then it's not really a free speech violation. It's just a somewhat creepy application of free speech. But my concern is in a lot of these places that you're going to have anonymous people claiming that you were offended, and then you're going to have that triggering official investigations where you're required to answer questions and where you might be suspended or disciplined or forced to attend some sort of sensitivity training if someone didn't like your opinion. Why do you think it's a good thing for America to see how mainstream the spirit of censorship has grown? Well, I think too many of us are too complacent. That we think that, sure, you're going to have a few people, extremists, who really don't share the same values that I do, who think that we should censor speech, but that's not mainstream. That's, you know, that's not really a risk. But I think it really is a risk. I mean, you look at relatively recent studies suggesting that substantial numbers of millennials believe that speech they don't like should be censored. You look at the prevalence of censorship and censorious attitudes on college campuses, 
and it's mainstream. It's a risk. Mm. The idea that we'll normalize censorship and denormalize traditional values of free speech are real and present, not any sort of abstract or theoretical thing. And I think that the more nutty students and uh, nutty professors that we see in the news, the more people will realize that it's an actual danger. Ken, one of the things you've written about in your blog is called a heckler's veto. What is that and how is it treated in law? A heckler's veto is the idea that the government might censor speech because people listening to it are going to get agitated and cause trouble. So the classic heckler's veto is the idea that you're talking to a crowd and they're really mad at you and they're going to start a riot. Mm. You see it in situations like when towns charge a lot more for security for a march by an unpopular group than for a popular group. That's a type of heckler's veto because it imposes costs on speech based on the reaction to the speech. And in general, in American law, courts have not allowed a heckler's veto to be official. They have not allowed the government to stop speech just because people react to it unhappily uh, or even violently, Mm. except in very narrow circumstances. Well, we're starting to see this across the news, particularly as we get into the political season, where counter-protesters will show up at protests or demonstrators will show up at political rallies. We're seeing these things on cell phone videos that are captured by bystanders. How is this likely to get sorted out in the courts in the years ahead? Well, we've seen just relatively recently an important decision out of the Midwest where the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit took a case involving a bunch of anti-Muslim protesters at a Muslim cultural festival. Mm. And basically these guys were there and they had a pig's head and they were shouting all sorts of, you know, bigoted and obnoxious things at these people at the festival. And because there was a crowd that seemed like it could get violent, the cops forced the protesters to go away, told them, if you don't stop and go away, uh, we're going to cite you Mm -hmm. for disturbing the peace. And what the Court of Appeals said was that that's a classic heckler's veto and you can't permit it, that the government can't just say, well, because you're upsetting people, we're shutting you down. They can only do it when there's a genuine immediate danger that they can't resolve. And there was no indication here that the police made any serious effort to protect these people or to prevent a riot from happening. Ken, speaking of obnoxious protesters, talk to us a bit about Twitter trolls. Where do they fit in our culture and legal system, and do they have any redeeming qualities? <laughs> well, I'd say that depends on the Twitter troll. <laughs> I think that there are satirists and people on Twitter who can make very deft social and political points by doing things that you might call trolling. But there's a lot, just like anywhere else on the Internet, a lot of static and noise and just crassness that I don't think contributes anything. Twitter is a place where... I think all of the worst elements of the Internet are sort of made even more instant and immediate, Mm. where, you know, it's not just writing something on the old Usenet or on a bulletin board or forum. It's typing out something that everyone sees immediately and doing it in just 140 characters. It's hard to classify as good or bad. There's a lot of stuff out there that's just plain threatening or insulting that I don't think contributes anything to anyone, but the ultimate question is always, what are we going to do about it? And I don't think that the existence of Twitter changes the basic rules that we should go by, the basic rules being the rule of law and the well-established free speech principles that the courts have upheld. And to the extent people are trying to uh, argue that Twitter is something new, something different that should change the law, I think they're wrong. There's always this temptation for people to say that, well, this is new and different, so new law should apply. So there's this word that I absolutely despise, uh, twible, which people have come up with referring to libel uttered on Twitter. (laughs) And the mere existence of the word implies that there's something different on Twitter, that somehow if you write something on Twitter, it should need new legal standards or new libel rules. And that's nonsense. We can handle statements on Twitter the same way we handle statements elsewhere. We can evaluate them under the same legal rules. And the suggestion that just because there's a slightly new technological application that we need to change the law is just not right. How have the courts been dealing with defamation suits that result from tweets? 
they really have not been handling them differently than they have any other writing. In other words, it doesn't trigger a different standard. You still have to prove that the statement is false. You still have to prove it's a statement of fact. It's only been treated somewhat differently in this way. Courts have increasingly realized that Internet statements are often not taken as seriously as statements elsewhere. When someone says, I'll kill you on Twitter, and they don't even know who or where you are, it's likely they don't mean it. Well, exactly. So that courts have hesitated to treat statements online with the same level of seriousness as if you wrote it in a letter or in a letter to the editor in the newspaper or something like that. And they have realized that reasonable people viewing things online are more likely to see it as insult and bluster and that type of thing. That doesn't mean that a statement online is automatically just opinion or just bluster, but courts look at the context. And so, for instance, if a statement about a company about how it's run by crooks mm. is on a bulletin board that's you know full of obscenities and sentence fragments and gibberish, then courts tend to say, well, I don't think people looking at this are going to see it as a statement of precise fact. They're going to see it as, you know, bluster. On the other hand, if it's in a location where everyone uh, acts like grown-ups and suggests that they have factual basis for their words, then courts might treat it as a statement of fact. Uh, like in an analyst report. So context matters. Exactly. And the context of Twitter is probably going to be seen by most people as a context of bluster and trolling. That doesn't mean you can't libel someone mm. or threaten someone on Twitter, but it's going to be a factor in the determination of whether something can be taken seriously. You know, every generation likes to complain about the generation that comes after it. And if you look at some of the polls or the attitudes of millennials, particularly when it comes to free speech, it, it can get a little alarming. In your blog, you've actually admitted that young people are terrible because our generation taught them awful values. <laughs> what did you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is this. When I'm seeing all these students saying that we should sacrifice the freedom of speech to achieve feelings of safety and uh, feelings of comfort, it's hard to blame them if the culture has been telling them basically that for years, mm -hmm. and especially since 9-11. Uh, if there's a drumbeat that we have to, in order to keep ourselves safe from terrorists and all the dangers of the world, that we have to give up basic freedoms, basic liberties, if we have to put up with the TSA guy groping us, even though there's no indication that the TSA ever successfully detects terrorists, mm. just because it might make us feel more safe or it might make us safe, then it's hard then to turn around and get mad at these same kids when they pick that up and apply it to other situations. So... If we should have to put up with the government spying on us because they think they need to as our parent and we need that to be safe, then we're probably also going to think that if our parent, whether it's the school or the town, needs to keep us safe by restricting scary speech, then, well, that must be part of the same thing. <laughs> Won't we baby boomers get the last laugh when the government forces these kids to pay our wine bills after we retire? <laughs> Or dialysis, that, right, yeah. either of those. <laughs> or both. Well, um, yeah, I, I, I'm between the baby boomers and the millennials myself, and I see it as something where, as the baby boomers head off to retirement homes <laughs> and uh, to Florida and places like that, they might wind up spending more time online. That might change the online culture and the speech culture in ways that we don't currently anticipate. That's and interesting. Who knows what an internet dominated by 80-year-olds rather than by 14-year-olds might be like. Well, Facebook has certainly aged. If you look at, the, at who's on there now, it's grandma. Oh, absolutely. You know, if you ask your kids, uh, anyone you know, under 18, whether they use Facebook, they'll roll their eyes at you <laughs> like you asked them whether they take Geritol. <laughs> to close on a more serious subject, perhaps more related to your day job, you've worked on both sides of the criminal justice system as both prosecutor and defense attorney. How significant is the problem of prosecutorial abuse? Well, it's very significant, and what's significant about it, I'm not saying is so much the magnitude or the frequency as the failure of the system to confront it. Generally, it's not detected. Generally, when it is detected by courts, it's excused or brushed aside, and generally, even when it's proven, it doesn't result in real consequences. The culture, for the most part, 
is wrapped up in the notion of law and order, that you know, what we do to keep everyone safe justifies mm-hmm. any uh, lack of niceties and that anything about rights is a matter of technicalities and lawyer tricks. Because of that, we have situations where prosecutors are able to do dramatic violations of defendants' rights, and it's just written off as something that's not significant or not important next to the value of making sure whoever did it, you know, gets what they deserve, or not letting lawyers get people off on so-called technicalities. You really have a system where prosecutors are very rarely disciplined in any substantial way, no matter what they do, where bar actions against prosecutors are incredibly rare, and where the prosecutorial institutions that are supposed to police them generally don't do much of a job of it. And so you have very few voices speaking out about this. You have, for instance, Judge Alex Kaczynski, who's a sort of a maverick judge on the Ninth Circuit, can't really be classified as conservative or Mm -hmm. liberal. He's sort of libertarian, who's been really going off on how significant this is and how bad of a job the courts have done about it. And part of the core of it is how can you expect people to respect authority, to respect due process, to respect law and order when the government does it? And what moral standing does the government have to enforce rules that it doesn't follow itself? How can we shine more of a light on this? Well, we need to do a few things. We need to build up institutions that inflict more significant consequences for misconduct. And I mean that both in terms of having an impact on cases so that if there is misconduct, it's actually going to tank a prosecutor's case. And I mean it in the sense that prosecutors who engage in misconduct should face career consequences. Mm -hmm. But there also has to be basic attitude and cultural changes. So long as we kind of buy into the Dick Wolf law and order thing where, you know, the right result is a conviction and all of the defense's arguments thrown aside and that it's an injustice when there are consequences for a deprivation of rights. As long as we have those attitudes, then, you know, all the institutions in the world aren't going to do us much good. We have to take the basic prevalent American independence and mistrust of central authority and actually apply it logically so that plenty of Americans are suspicious of bureaucracy. And, you know, if you tell them, do you want the EPA to come in here with their clipboards and tell you how to run a business? They'll say, of course not. That's, you know, that's tyranny. But, you know, ask them, well, is it okay if the cops come in with badges and guns and tell her what to do? Somehow there are more tolerant of that. And that's the basic disconnect that we have to fix culturally. Well, if more people read Pope Hat, Ken, perhaps they'll get more sensitized to the issue. Thanks so much for being on the show. It was my pleasure. Thank you. That was former federal prosecutor and criminal defense attorney Ken White here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. You can check out Real Clear Radio on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. Real Clear Radio Hour is a partnership with Real Clear Politics, which the New York Times has called an invaluable tool for anyone interested in politics or public affairs. That wraps up our show for this week. You have a Merry Christmas, and please join us next week, same time, same station. See you then.